got everything you need to ready, set, go back to school. Blog Talk Radio. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Sam Crow Radio. Um, I want to apologize for the slight delay here. Um, apparently, Blog Talk Radio just informed me about two minutes ago or so that they're having some technical issues with their phone lines, um, and so they've given me an alternate number to call in. So obviously, hopefully, all of you can hear me right now. I'm hoping. I'm very, very excited because now we can get back to doing our interview with Carl McDowell, who, of course, as we all know, was one of the uh, former castmates of the Sons of Anarchy. So instead of having him hold on any longer, we're going to have him jump right onto the phone. Hey, Carl. Hey, Cindy. I'm here. I can hear you, and you, you're right next to me. I can actually hear you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Sorry about the delay. Apparently, Blog Talk Radio has some big technical issue, and I keep calling in on the same number for three minutes, and I couldn't get through. So they gave me an alternate number, so this should work, so we are all good. I'm hoping that everybody is listening in. Thank you so much for getting on so early just for me. I appreciate it. It's all right. I'll do that. I do. Anything for you and Sam. It's cool. Oh, my God. He's so sweet, isn't he? We have to we have to love and support Carl McDowell and everything he does right now, like from now until the end of time. <laughs> Thank you very much because he's such a sweetheart. Okay, I kind of wanted to restart for those people that didn't get a chance to listen in on the last interview. So I kind of want to start off maybe from the beginning again. Um, now, I kind of found it out of the norm for you to have um, projected desires of pursuing a teaching career at one point in time. Now, can you maybe tell us what strayed you from that um, course in your life? From being a teacher? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I just didn't want – I was uh, maybe like a semester away from graduating, and I didn't want to graduate and not use my degree, so I decided okay. to drop out and come and pursue comedy or acting and see where that took me. And I gave myself okay. like a two-year limit. If it went anywhere, I'd stick, keep doing it, and if it didn't, I'd go back, finish my degree, and teach, and be a teacher for the rest of my life. Okay. Had you had some so it, in your family that was teaching, or, or was this just, how did that come about? No, well, my first year of college, I joined this group <clears throat> called Power, uh, People mm-hmm. of the World and Racism, and we would always uh, go do these things for kids, like have social events, uh, gyms, and just all kinds of sorts of things for kids. And uh, and we would touch them at a young age to where we would, uh, you know, make them not want to be racist. And it was like a small racist town in Illinois. Mm-hmm. And I figured, like, you know what, if you get to them early enough, you can teach them, you can mold them, you can make them be good people from an early age. So I wanted to get down and teach early ages so they wouldn't be little douchebags. <laughs> We don't have any of those in society whatsoever now, do we? Of course not. <laughs> no. no, no, no. You would have probably made a really good actually a kick-ass teacher. You have the personality and the vernacular for it, and you're very, very socially friendly. So I think it probably would have been a really cool thing. But we're very glad that you chose acting instead, because otherwise you'd miss out on all that cool stuff. Just saying, just throwing that out there. No. <laughs> For those who don't know, obviously, Carl is a native of Chicago, which means he's a kissing cousin to me because I'm in Wisconsin. Of course, he's not in Chicago anymore, unfortunately, or we'd be able to hang out, like, every day. Um, but obviously, knowing you're a native of Chicago, I understand that growing up, you had experience in two different realms, of course. You know, you've had your brushes with law enforcement and, of course, the gang lifestyle. Now, maybe expand upon those two areas. Maybe tell me how these elements played a factor in your life, both then and now. Um, <clears throat> then it did because... I spent a lot of time uh, just doing bad things, uh, in and out of jails and juvenile homes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, it was just like, I, it was normal at the time, but it was, looking back on it, it wasn't the greatest time. Um, I mean, you kind of, I'm kind of ashamed of it, kind of, but I guess it mm-hmm. builds you, it builds character, it builds whatever I have now, um, and I look back on that, and then. I'm not proud of the person that I was, but I'm proud of the person I've become from it. And I can see, like, you know, I was thinking about, like, going back and, and talking to kids and, like, telling them, you know, I was in that situation. And you don't have to be, stay in this situation. You can get out and you can do things um, that rather than just being a gang and wind up in jail or dead. I got you. How, did you, how was your initiation into that lifestyle? I mean, how did you find yourself in that in that world? Well, I have older cousins um, that are uh, men. They were boys at the time. And um, they got into the whole gang life and the drug life and all that kind of stuff. 
So whenever I would go around uh, their house, I would hang out with them. And just getting friendly with all the gang members and all the drug dealers, I was adopted, so to speak, into the gang. And um, everything went from there. I got it. And how long was that for you approximately? I would think um, maybe I was like 10, 11, or 12, something like that, one of the up until the time I was like fifteen. Okay. And of course we've learned our lesson and we're not a troublemaker anymore. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> not that sort of trouble. I was just gonna say for anybody that talks to Carl, you already know that he is just he is just he's the man. He's out and about, he's everywhere all the time and, and uh yeah. We'll see how far you stir away from trouble, my friend. We'll see. <laughs> um I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, obviously, I know that you were in sports. The introduction of sports obviously proved to be paramount in terms of your uh, life direction. I know that it led to your attendance at Illinois uh, Valley College and served as an entryway into theater, of course. Um, and I know mm-hmm. it was at that time in your life. I know you performed in both A Christmas Carol and Of Mice and Men. So maybe yeah. if you could portray to our audience, Um, your attitude towards acting as a younger man and if you felt any apprehension to perform early on? Um, Well, apprehension, I I didn't want to do it at all, really. Um, The way it was brought to me was uh, it was a class that I was given when I was a football player. They would give us these easy classes so we could uh, just pass our classes, not have to worry about that, and just play football. So it was a class they gave me called Theater Practicum, and um, you just go and build sets and tear down sets and um, go home. And I, the coach told me, like, you never have to go to this class. Just, you know, uh, so I took that literally. I didn't take it. All my other teammates would go to class every now and again. I never went to this class. And the teacher told me that if um, I wanted to pass this class, I had to do a play for them. Uh-huh. And I did not want to do this play at all. Like, I cried to my coach, and I cried to this teacher, and I was like, look, I'll come all the time. I just don't want to do this play, and they wanted me to do this play for some reason, whatever reason it was, and my coach thought it would be hilarious to make me do this play because I was a freshman and um, brought the whole team out, and I was, like, scared out of my mind. I didn't want to do it, and then I did it, and it was, like, the best feeling ever, and I never wanted to stop after that. Were you nervous at all, or like I don't even want to say apprehension, but just um, you know, how did that experience? Did that help you, or did you take anything away from that? That you know, you have in your new experiences. Meaning, what did you learn young on that you've taken with you? I was nervous. I was, <clears throat> I was freakishly nervous. Uh, I remember, like, it was seasoned actors that that were um, Lenny and George, and they they taught me like you know a lot of what to do and how to do it and they made me laugh when they when when things were getting too serious and so like they helped me um not be so nervous and to to perform so like when the when the team and everybody came I was so nervous and everything and they do practical jokes and they would lighten me up and then the show just went so smooth that after that I was not nervous anymore and I I figured if you was prepared there's nothing to be nervous about just go on and do it and was it successful for you, do you think? I mean, were you kind of thinking, oh, my God, I'm on a stage and I'm totally embarrassed, and what the hell are these people thinking doing this? No, it was it was totally successful. Um, I loved it. Um, I guess, like, it was, a, it was a joke for my coach and the players who thought, like, maybe I would get up there and bomb and freeze up or something like that, and I didn't. And it was really cool. I was glad that I didn't. So, um yeah, I guess it was, it was really cool. It was a success, and it just made me want to do it even more. Like, any time they had a play coming, I was I was the first one there. Like, what what are we doing this time? Let's do it. Okay, I got it. And at that point in time, when you were first starting your acting, were you, uh, I don't want to say typecast because that comes later on in life, obviously, but were you, you know, because of your size, because of how you are, it was kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm only going to play this or this, or they picked you just for that? Do you know what I'm saying? I do. Um, and at the time, I was really small. I was a wide receiver, quarterback slash dude, so I wasn't as big as I am now. And um I wasn't really, I didn't have hair either, so I wasn't tight oh cast so much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you I wasn't tight cast. So we oh my God, has anyone looked at Carl? I don't even know if he's talking about himself <laughs> right now. Really? <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, no, I wasn't big and I didn't have hair at all. 
I had a little facial hair, so, so that was cool. Okay. Um, but I wasn't typecast. I did I did of mice and men. I did Christmas Carol. I did um, the Wiz, and I was the lion. So I mean, I wasn't typecast at all back then. Now I'm finding myself typecast, but I don't mind. Gotcha. Well, obviously, of course, you're a seasoned actor now as compared to, you know, being in school and doing something like that, obviously. So I hear you. Now, one of the qualities that I want to highlight about you and which actually draws me to admire your individuality even more so is that I know you possess musical talent. Um, and to those that are unaware, I know that you're a drummer, a guitar player, and a pianist, actually, which I have a hard time believing because this big, gargantual guy plays <laughs> piano. I'm like, holy crap. Um were you offered any kind of musical education or did any training relative to music? Um, well, I'm not a musician at all. I can I can I can mess around on those instruments, but I'm not like I can perform any concerts or anything like that. Um, the um, I did for theater. When you're a theater major, you have to be a music minor. So I had to take drums um, in college. I had to take piano in college, and um, I was teaching myself the guitar, but that didn't go over so well. And I was okay. just in this band. Um, I was in this band, and they was teaching me to play the bass guitar, which is the best instrument for me. Like, if I was to ever go back into the band stage or any of that kind of stuff, I would pick up that bass and I would run with it. That would be my that would be my instrument. <laughs> really? You know what I'm saying? Look at that. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm going to have to interrupt you for a minute because I have I'm, what I'm guessing to be a very lovely lady holding on the line to try to talk to you. So I realize we're supposed to wait till the hour's up, but I don't want her to wait for 20 minutes on hold. So you you got time to take a question, then we'll go back to you. Then you can go back to talking to me. How's that sound? That sounds awesome. All right. Let me just see what we got. Good morning. Hello? Hello? Okay, Carl, did you hear anything? I didn't hear anything. Okay, I guess there was no one who wanted to talk to us. Well, okay, that's fine. I'll talk to you all day long. I like having you in my ear. <laughs> and I, I thought you might appreciate that comment. Um, now, back to you being a musician. Um, did your, or do your, I should say, really, future desires, do you think, will they include any kind of musical performances? Or are you kind of thinking, yeah, I'm just not good at this, forget it? Well, you know, I like music. I love music, really. Like, I can't do anything without listening to music. Uh, if I'm cleaning, I'm listening to music. If I'm driving, I'm listening. So showering, I'm I'm singing in the shower. Like, that's all I do is music, music, music. But um, I don't think I would want to be in a band or anything like that again. I mean, just for kicks, I like the karaoke, and I like to do stuff like that. If somebody uh-huh. wanted me up there, I would come up there. But I don't think I would want to go the whole band route again. That was, like, way too much. I gotcha. No, I understand. And I'll bet if we put a couple more beers into Carl, I'm betting he's karaokeing a whole of a lot more. It's going to take a <laughs> Just saying. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, out of all the things that you've played before musically, do you happen to think that you're versed in any of them? I mean, would you say, yeah, this is something I'm good at? Um, well, like instrument-wise? Yeah, instrument-wise, yeah. I, the piano was pretty cool. I liked the piano. Um, I used to, like, we had these pods where you can go into these pods and just practice these pianos and they were soundproof and I would go into these things and I would be listening to like Bare Naked Ladies of Slipknot and then playing some classical music and singing like three different songs. It would be three different songs going, I'm playing one, singing one, listening to another and it was just so much fun. I love the piano. If I, wish, if I can get back into that, that would be pretty cool. But the bass is the best instrument of ever. I gotcha. And then, um, can you describe for me which you find more enriching, the acting, the sports, or the music, if you had to kind of give it a hierarchy, if you will? How does that rank in your life? Um, sports was pretty cool because it got me out of a lot of stuff, and I was really good at it. Um, but, like, I think acting is something that you can't explain, really, because, like, the things that you give of yourself in acting, like, I can play three football games and come home and still – have energy to do things, but if I go on set for an hour or two, I'll come home wiped, and I don't understand how this happens, but I, I can't hold my eyes open, I can't hold my head up, and it's just something that you give while you're acting. Um, okay. You give a piece of yourself, and it's and it's crazy. It's more physical than anything. 
I imagine so, definitely. And in terms of the sporting side of things, I wanted to ask you, I mean, were you ever at a point where you played on a professional level or were you offered that sort of thing or was that something that you were aspiring to you didn't do? Or I played semi-pro for um, Indiana and Illinois, um, and that was the, the extent of that. I wasn't big enough in, to go to the NFL, I don't think. I went to an NFL game, and the punter was, like, bigger than me, so... I don't think I would have been great in the NFL, but I played for these two semi-pro teams, and they were pretty good. And that was like, I guess I reached the height of my career, and that's what I wanted to do. I understand. And it's funny just listening to you talk about that because I'm like, oh, my God, Carl again is referencing that someone else in the world is actually bigger than him, which I have a hard time believing. <laughs> because, again, if you look at Carl, you'll notice he's not a short person, Okay. The man is muscle, and he's big, and he's tall. So I'm having a hard time buying that one, but okay, fine. I'll go with it if that's what you think. Perfectly fine. <laughs> now, before we move along, it looks like we have another caller. So let's just see if we can get this one on the line before we keep going. So hang on one second. All right. Good morning. Hello? Hi, good morning. Hey. And who am I talking hey. to? I'm sorry? Who, is that? who am I talking to? This will be Helen Stoner Banks. Hi, good morning. <laughs> I think I, I was the one that got in all night. Nice. I, I, I was just going to say, look at Helen calling in nice and early here. That's okay. <laughs> I was just trying. interviewing him, but I said, I'm not going to have her hold. We'll just go ahead and have her on. So you know, of course, that Carol is in my ear as well as you right now. <laughs> I just wanted to drop it and say hi, Carl. Like I promised I would call in. Hello, um, Helen. Uh, <laughs> I chat with you wow. all the time on Facebook and Twitter, so it was just kind of cool to actually talk to you. Isn't it, though? I have, like, the coolest job in the world. I get to have these people in my ear constantly, and then I get to have people like you in my ear constantly. It's actually kind of like all of us being in a bar only without the booze at 9 a.m. So, <laughs> kind of. What can I say? Helen, do you have a good question for Carl? Because I'm sure you do. <laughs> Not really. I mean, he's, we, like I said, we talk a lot on Facebook and Twitter, so. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Yeah, maybe he's. I Ellen think he's no a pretty question. cool guy. I like that the fact that he's down to earth, and just because he's a celebrity doesn't mean that he, you know, he shuns others. <laughs> That's, That's absolutely awesome, isn't it? It is. It's totally cool. I'm like, oh, my God, you could talk to, like, Carl for hours and hours and hours. So wait till Dayton Kelly comes on next. I'm going to be like, hello? Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be a different experience. But Carl is an absolute sweetheart. He is. He's absolutely wonderful. And I'm glad that yeah. you called in. Oh, well, you are a big sweetheart. And I was just happy to be able to call in and say hi. That's all. Oh, Ooh, hello. Thanks for calling. Looking forward to uh, your movie, too. Ooh. Ooh. What? I said looking forward to seeing your movie. Oh, yeah. The one you were just working on. A mini Ooh, splendid thing. Yeah. We're not that, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> that far yet, Helen. We're working on it. Oh, little by Oh, not a problem at all. Right, we'll let you go. Thank right you for up. calling. Not a problem. Um, and try to well, let you guys get to it, and I'll listen to the rest of your show. And have You're a good awesome. one. You rock. <laughs> you have a good weekend, doll. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, look at that. He's going to have, like, 50 women calling in to say, oh, my God, Carl, you're so wonderful. And then they're going to tell me things I don't even know about <laughs> Carl. And that sucks because I talked to Carl, too. Ouch. Okay. So Hollywood, of course, got its first taste of Carl in 2004, obviously, when you started doing background work and, of course, you acted as a production assistant. Now, mm-hmm. did you feel as if that this – planted more of a desire in you to pursue acting because of that? Um, yeah, well, I, I did want to pursue acting before that, but it made me want to do it more after. Uh, like, uh, just learning. It made me want to learn more. Like, I I was um, not, I was behind the scenes, and I just wanted to learn everything. So, like, if I was to get in front of the camera, I wouldn't be ignorant or dumb to whatever they were saying to me, like camera left or camera right or... Um, you know, whatever direction they would give me, I would know what it meant because I was behind the scenes and I saw this being done so much. Okay, I got it. And was this something that you, that you took too naturally, meaning that you kind of stepped into this and it was like, oh, yeah, you know what, I can do production, I can do this, I can do that? Or, you know, was it a learning curve for you? No, it was, it was pretty natural. I mean, it's, it's not hard. They tell you what to do, you do it pretty much. Um, okay. Yeah, it's not it's not hard at all. I don't think. Okay. I have a hard time picturing anyone telling Carl McDowell what to do. Well, maybe Kurt <laughs> Sutter. <laughs> it's just too hard. I'm sorry I can't fathom it. That's okay, though. I'm just going to have to do that because you weren't always the big megastar that you are right now. 
I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> yeah, we're on a roll this morning. It's early. What do you expect? I've had a half cup of coffee. Um, had any of these skills you mentioned um, strengthened your ability to act, do you think, that contributed at all? Um, what skills are we talking about? Meaning what you what you took away from, you know, like your work with background work and, of course, production assistant, had that helped to strengthen anything as it was relative to your acting career? Yeah, I think everything you do helps out in your acting. Um, production helps out <clears throat> because you see, you see, um, like, you don't set with Tom Cruise, you don't set with Adam Sandler. You see everybody doing they think, and, and you see them taking direction, and, ha and when they tell them to do these things, how they do them, and you see those things. But just like in general life, whatever you're doing in life helps you out in acting. Like being a gangbanger, if somebody tell me, you know, this, you should be mad right here, you should want to hurt this person, but show it in your face, and I'll go back to those days of me wanting to hurt people, and I'll drudge up those feelings, and that's how it comes out. So anything that you do in life helps you out in acting. I gotcha. Now, what prompted your decision? I know that you attended the uh, the Bobby Chance Actor Workshop, so I was curious to ask you what what brought that all about. Um, one of my friends used to go there, and really? he was raving about this class, and and he was like telling me he was like, you got to come to this class. These this Bobby Chance, it's it's the Chance family, really. It's her husband and her son, and they all like just great act acting coaches so i go to this class and i'm like this lady is insane and she yelling at you and she telling she making you cry and um uh, like they have saturdays just crying classes you go in and you yell and cry and that's it and um so i wanted to go to this class and i went in and i fell in love man it was like the best class ever mm -hmm. and uh that's how it, yeah one of my friends just invited me to this class Okay. Now, do you find yourself or envision yourself doing, um, I don't want to say further education because it's not like college, obviously, but just um, furthering yourself in terms of an actor education-wise? Do you see that happening down the road? Yeah, you always. Um, I think you should always probably, if you're not in front of a camera, you should probably be, probably be um, being coached or taking classes or something like that. Like if you're not okay. being creative, you should be wanting to be creative. Sure. And do you think you'll ever find yourself in a capacity where you might serve as a teacher yourself in terms of mentoring as it's relative to acting or production or et cetera? Um, I don't see it happening, but if it did happen, I'd be I'd step in there. I'd okay. do it. You'd be opposed to it. I wouldn't be opposed to it. Okay, got it. Or being on my reality shows when my treatments get accepted <laughs> and I'm like big and famous, I'll be like, Carl! What's going on, man? Let's get you on reality TV because, of course, I can picture I, you are a walking reality show, my friend. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Moving right along. All right. Um, now, I know a testament to your character, in my opinion, is exemplified in the time that you donate to the organization, People of the World, and Racism. I'd like you to educate our audience on their mission and how others may contribute in their own way if they'd like to. Um. Well, this was the thing I did in college. Um, I still... I had two mentors from that, and it was one Kim Abel, and it was one Mary Tully, <clears throat> and they got me into this. And it was it's called Power, but the acronym was People of the World and Racism, and that was what we would think we would uh, go to kids because like it was really racist town in Oglesby, Illinois. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it's like no. yeah, it was it was really bad. Um, so they figured if you go to the kids and you teach the kids that um, you know, interracial, whatever, is not bad, that they could see that racism is horrible. And uh, so me being black, my teammates being black, and um, we would all go to these gyms and play basketball with these kids, play football with these kids, and just teach them, you know, that whatever their parents was teaching them about black people weren't true. And uh, okay. and it was really cool. So, like, we would have lunches, breakfasts, just anything you can do with these with, with all these kids and stuff. And um, and it was awesome. They they weren't racist. They was we was teaching them. And uh, I don't know if it's still going now. I haven't talked to them in a while, but um, I'll see it and I'll post it up on Facebook and let people know how they can get involved. I was just going to mention that. Now, do you find yourself, or do you think you will find yourself somewhere down the line, um, aligning with or or venturing into working with other charities if you haven't already? 
Um, I haven't. It's been a few um, charities. Um, a few friends would ask me to do charity work and stuff like that. Um, and some I have done and some just didn't pan out. But, yeah, I'm totally into the charity thing. And, and I I love to donate my time. So whatever you can come up with, I can probably do it. Call for president. Throwing that out there again. <laughs> Another stop. Oh, Miguel, for president. He may not be tax yeah. teller, but he'll be president of something. Just going to say president that. president of something. That's right. We're, we're working that out right now. President of karaoke. That's it. Yeah. Facebook status for talking. today. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right. Now, obviously, due to the lack of time, because we don't have all day, and um, you maintaining such a large body of work, um, I was going to highlight various pieces of your career, of course. And uh, because we are Sam Crow Radio, a plethora of listeners, of course, wish to hear of your Sons of Anarchy experience. First off, let's start off about the how, whys, and when surrounding your role. Tell me how you got it, why you took it, when did it happen? Um, I had an audition. Before before I did the role, I didn't even know what Sons of Anarchy was. So <laughs> I had an audition for Sons of Anarchy, and I was like, all right, uh, this seems pretty crazy because the characters were called Luther and Vandrill. So I thought this was like a comedy. I didn't know what it was. So I was like, well, let me watch an episode so I can see what I'm getting into here. I watch an episode, and I see uh, Katie, and I was like, whoa, Peggy Bundy's in this, and I'm, like, excited. <laughs> <and> I, <laughs> so so uh, I watch the episode, and I'm like, all right, well, I'll do it this way. I go in, and I read, and um, and uh, it was a cool experience to go in and read. Um, <clears throat> I read for it. I read for Luther, but they gave me the part of Vandross, so they called me, and I was like, we want to give you the part of Vandross, and I was like, all right, let's do it. And I go in and I hang out with all the cast and the crew and all that kind of stuff. And it was like the most fun you can ever have on set. And uh, I know everybody loves to hear about Charlie. And he is like the most, the coolest dude you you can meet. Like we talked for an hour just while they were setting up, me, him. Just sat and talked about where where we would like to go in the world and what we would like to do and all that sorts, all those sorts of things. And they were just like kids, big kids. They would fight and wrestle each other and all that kind of stuff. The director keep having to tell us like, Once you guys cut it out, just calm down and let's do the thing. So it was okay. like it was like we kept getting reprimanded by teachers and stuff like that. It was pretty cool though. So basically um, you were naughty before the role and then you were naughty with the role. I see how that works. <laughs> basically just naughty if you're like you're I'm understanding that. Did you um, yeah. happen to have a did you have a relationship with someone that you I mean in terms of just actually scoring for doing the reading? I mean, how did did you know someone on the show or how did you get connected with the show? No, it was um my I guess my agents or managers hooked it up that I got the audition and then I went in and read and um they hired me on. I didn't know anybody from the show. Um after it was like Chris uh, Chris oh, I forget his name. <laughs> wow. It's, McDon- no, it's not McDonald. That's one of my other friends. But Christopher something or other, the big one with the big hair, he was he, he's a comedian now. And um, we've interacted a little bit after the show. But, um, yeah, no, I didn't know anybody before the show. I didn't even know what that show was. But now I'm like a huge fan of the show. And I've watched all seasons except for five because I want to watch them all at once. So now that it's done, I can – get into watching season five but like i was like the biggest fan of the show and i was like wow i remember my character did something against charlie hunnam's character and i was like standing up to him or something like that and i'm thinking like who is this little dude i can kick his ass and and then i watched the show and i was like wow i can't believe my character did that that was so stupid he stood up to the bravest man in america kind of thing so that was that was a real cool thing and now I have witnesses because there are people listening to the show. So now did you hear that, everybody? Carl's going to be watching <laughs> season five from start to finish. So big party at Carl's house. We're all coming over. We're going to all watch some fantasy. They're like one big SOA party. Hey, maybe we can have Charlie come over. Maybe. Yeah. Right. Okay, <laughs> fine. And just to preface this, I, I do want to make a point to mentioning this because, of course, Sam Crow and myself have discussed this, and I'm sure I've told the listening audience this before. Um, I'm going to try very hard within the course of Sam Crow Radio Everybody seems to have that fascination like you're talking about with Charlie Hunnam. So I just want to make it very, very clear to you and everybody else that comes on to this show that you have your own individuality. And I would much rather talk about Carl McDowell than Charlie Hunnam. 
Now, I'm not going to say wow. it's not odd because dude is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd walk on coals for him. Okay, but, you know, we can't talk about Charlie all day because that's a whole other interview, which maybe I'll get before I'm dead. But I just want to, you know, I want to obviously make a definitive line that obviously without people like yourself, you know, Charlie Hunnam doesn't make Sons of Anarchy. Sons of Anarchy is yeah. made by a team of cast members, you being one of them, of course. So I just want to kind of take the light off of Charlie. Although it's pretty cool to, to hear you say that he is so grounded and so, you know, easy to talk to in such a, I've heard this before, that he's just a hands-on, terrific person. Very approachable, very, very nice. It's very cool to hear. Um, I wanted to ask you maybe if you could speak to us in regards to maybe your most memorable experience, whether it be off the scene or on camera. What, what's the most memorable thing you remember from doing Sons of Anarchy? Um, I'm doing Sons of Anarchy. All right. Um, Peter Weller was the director, and he was obviously RoboCop. So um, it was it was a guy on a porch that was supposed to shoot. Um, so he wasn't doing it right. And Peter Weller gets up and grabs the gun, and he was like, this is how you're supposed to do it. And he cocks it, and he shoots it, and they was like, wait, you can't do that. You can't do that. And he was like, I'm, I'm effing RoboCop. I can do what the hell I want. And, <laughs> and that was like the coolest thing ever. That was the cool. I was like, I, I immediately run to my phone and tweet, RoboCop just did some cool stuff on set. And it was, it was, it was sick. Oh my God, really? How funny is that yeah. actually? Now I have to ask this because this is just idle curiosity. Cindy wants to know because I can ask this. Were you privy to or able to get an opportunity to spend any amount of time with either Katie Skull or Kurt Sutter or Ron Perlman? You know, obviously more of the bigger entities on the show. Um, Perlman. When we was table reading, uh, he was pretty cool. Um, I sat right um, at the table read. Me and Katie sat next to each other, and she was really cool, and Kurt sat next to her. Um, so me and Katie talked, like, it, and it was it was weird that it was a table read. And um, it wasn't like we was passing notes, but we just kept saying, like, sly remarks to each other uh, really? during the table read, just, like, trying to make each other laugh. So that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I think I, I talked mostly to uh, Charlie and um, Tig. Those dudes, they were just like really cool on set. Okay, I gotcha. And of course, we've spoken. I know that Ted Alva and I have spoken before, and you know, some of the other cast members I've asked about the camaraderie. It's pretty apparent to me, and I think it would concur that it's like a brotherhood, if you will, both on screen and off screen. Meaning that these are it types really is, of yeah. And that's absolutely awesome. Did you have the same experience in terms of, I know that the security was very tight on set. Did you find that that was the case in terms of limited access to the set and things of that nature? No. I mean, it was it was real secretive. Like, um, we'd have to sign for scripts, and we'd have to give the scripts back. And it was it was real. Like, the table read was kind of like uh, they'd call us up and be like, hey, you got to be at this location at a certain time. So it was real secretive, but... I didn't see any security problems or anything like that. So okay. I couldn't get gotcha. to wherever I wanted to go or do whatever I wanted to do. I gotcha. And you actually made my next question right out the damn window because you just revealed that you haven't watched season five because I was going to say, okay, because I don't know if a cast member would view this differently just to kind of ask you, you know, your take on Kurt Sutter's perception, how, you know, he presents the show um, because obviously you've read scripts, so you see those things. Um, is there ever or was there ever a time in your experience from the show where, you read something one day, and then all of a sudden, what actually transpired on camera was not the same thing, scene-wise. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. Um, not that I, not that I saw. Uh, okay. However, like the um, what me and I read for Luther, and I got the role of Vandros. But the things that we read in the audition was totally different than what we did uh, shooting-wise. So um, I don't know. Maybe they change up things. They are they are really secretive because I don't think they want people knowing what's going to come out and when it's going to come out. Um, so uh, maybe they, you know, they don't they don't want things to be leaked. Of course, that makes perfect sense, obviously. And do you foresee or do you think there might be the potential for you to be a um, reoccurring member on the show again? Um, I don't know. Maybe, hopefully, they were talking about bringing my family back um, in season four. Okay. Um, so I thought that they would bring them back in season five, but they didn't. So I don't know. Maybe if they stay in Oakland, I don't know how season five played out. But if they stay in Oakland, maybe we can come back. I'm hoping so. Wonderful. 
Yes, because then you can go on the <laughs> show and then you can get, you know, we all know that Cindy's perpetually single. So you could find me a husband on the show because I'm just going to say, I would say, totally you know, find you a husband. Charlie Hunnam, um, okay, wait, no, everyone wants him. I could name off about, uh, yeah, okay, we could go all day long about that one. But no, again, now we got Carl for president, Carl for karaoke, and now Carl for Sons of Anarchy. I got a lot of work I got to do. Oh, and he's going to be on my show. You have to do show. a lot. Oh, maybe I should start a fan club for Carl, too. Carl McDowell fan club. Yeah, we'll work on that later. <laughs> While you're doing karaoke you a, lot of work a couple to do. of years. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. in, in, including interviewing you. Okay. Now, I want to kind of talk about, obviously, some of the further things you've done on television, um, which I know included The League, The Bernie Mac Show, and Chelsea Lately. Um, tell me, what, what did you take away from knowing the infamous Bernie Mac? Because, obviously, I thought that might be a heck of an experience for you. So tell us about him. It was. It was, like, one of the only times I've ever been starstruck was uh, doing a Bernie Mac show. And I went there to be an extra. So I just wanted to see Bernie Mac and um, and talk to him. And so I was waiting for him to come, and I was nervous. And then, and I get there, and he's there, and I start talking to him. I was like, hey, man, I'm from Chicago. And we wound up, like, living maybe, like, ten blocks away from each other in Chicago. And um, I didn't know him, though. And then, um, like, we just talked for a long time. And then he, he was like, you know what, I'm going to hook you up, man. Just hang out right here. And then he's doing a scene, and he, like, gets me in the scene. And uh, I thought that was, like, the coolest thing you could do because I wasn't SAG at the time. I wasn't, like, an actor at the time. I was just strictly background. And he gets me in the scene, and, like, all my family and friends was like, was that you on a Bernie Mac show? And I'm like, yeah, that was cool. So it was really cool that he did all that stuff for me, and he didn't have to. And it was just from a conversation that we had. Okay, I've got it. And, of course, let's look at the flip side of it because, of course, you're talking about him, and then you have the experience with Chelsea lately. I, I'm curious to hear about Chelsea Handler because I, I would be the first one to tell you her and I have similar personalities, but I, I just think she's just rude and obnoxious. So maybe you could change my perception here. What was an experience <laughs> like that? Honestly, I mean, watch her. I mean, you know, I mean, I could see her boozing it up, sitting there interviewing people, and I'm like, yeah. Big difference between Cindy and Chelsea lately. Just saying, I don't have a midget in the middle of my living room running around hopping up and down right now. I'm just going to tell you. That. So, well, how did Do you, you not like uh, Chewy too? I, I did the I, show I, strictly to see Chewy. I, you know what? Chewy is awesome, and I sometimes wonder, where did you find Chewy? Is there, like, a league of midgets out there somewhere? And, hey, <laughs> I am not discriminatory one bit. I'm going to throw that out there. I love my gays. I love my midgets. I love my non-midgets. I love my Carl McDowell, et cetera. Mm. But, you know, I think it, it's just different. You know what I mean? Her screen perception. So I guess I'm curious to, A, how did you get involved with Chelsea lately? And then am I wrong in my perception? Just curious. Uh, well, now, with her, I, I don't know how wrong you are. Like, I've seen her a few times, and she's really cool. Like, and then one time I saw her, before I did the show, I saw her um, at the at the movies. It was me and two of my friends just at the movies. We was going to see W and um, another movie. It was, it was the weirdest thing that she was just there by herself. And she came over and talked to us, and then she came into the theater where we were, but it was the wrong movie or something like that, and she left. But she was really cool. Like, she was really cool, and you would think somebody uh, like that would be standoffish and not want to talk to anybody, and that's probably why she was there by herself. But she came over to us and she just started talking to us and hanging out with us, and that was pretty cool. Um, but on the show, I didn't see her on the show when I did it. I did a sketch for her show, and um, so, yeah, I didn't see her then. But she's pretty cool from what I've seen of her. Okay. I got it. Well, that's a cool thing. If you give her a recommendation, I guess I gotta kind of give her some leeway. Maybe we'll have her on the show. Hey, I talked to my buddy Carl Chelsea. Grab yourself a drink and midget and call me. Just throwing that out there. Um, I think you should get Chewy on the show. That would be awesome. Oh my God, I just think I would laugh through the whole show. Okay, I can't interview people where I'm constantly <laughs> laughing. I'm already trying to hold it in with you. Thank you very much. I feel like we've been at the bar for an hour now. Um, had your preference? lied more to comedic roles as your stand-up comedian? Do you find yourself more drawn to that or no? No, I'm totally drawn to drama. Um, I get comedic roles a lot, but um, if I had a choice, I would choose dramatic roles. I like it. I mean, it's, you put more of yourself into it. It's really easy to do comedy um, and to get a laugh. Um, and maybe I shouldn't say easy. I mean, that's not a bad choice of words, but I guess it's easy for me to do it 
so like it's harder for me to do dramatic roles and I like the challenge of dramatic roles. Okay, I gotcha. Now, and and I don't mean this to be insulting whatsoever, but obviously, in just knowing you as a person, and of course your physicality speaking, do you think you could ever get yourself to a point where you know you're doing that dramatic role, and you know sometimes you have to look within yourself, you know, where you have a a, a tearful scene, let's say, you know, is Carl capable of that just because of his own vernacular? Do you know what I mean? To cry? Could you pull that off? Meaning like a very dramatic, tearful type scene? Yeah, yeah, I can pull that so? off. <laughs> yeah. I, no, honestly, I have to throw that out there. You know what I mean? Because if you look at yourself, you're such a commanding presence. Like, you know, when you walk, uh, you know, on the Sons of Anarchy and, and here you are doing this role and looking at you there and just looking through your past history, it's just, I'm, I'm trying to picture that just to see if, if that would be a stretch for you or a challenge for you, do you think, because of that type of work? Uh, I would totally pull it off. I would, I would love to, in fact. Like, um... There's no role that I would turn down. So, like, whatever whatever challenge comes, I'm going to face it head on and I'm going to uh, make it happen. I'll get there eventually. And uh, so, yeah, I would not turn down that sort of role. I would not turn down a gay role. I would not turn down a comedy role. Whatever you bring, I'll get there. Well, I guess, it, you know, the one thought that's going through my head, and I'm sure the girls would agree to this that are listening especially, I'm thinking that I should call a producer friend of mine and say, Carl McDowell has to do drag. We're going to put him in a wig, <laughs> and a dress, nylons and heels, and make that bad boy be a woman. Uh, I'm, I'm that just, would be, I can't help myself. I that would I'd be a crack-up. It would be a crack up. If it was a dramatic one, I'd have to like sit and drag in my house for like a day or two so I can get all the laughs out. And then once <laughs> I did that, I, <laughs> I'd be all right. Beautiful. I was going to say, because you know Ron Perlman just did that not so long ago. He was dressed up as a female in one of the projects that he's got upcoming, actually. I saw him in a wig and a dress and all that stuff. And how funny is that, right? Clay Morrow. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know? That that would be hilarious. I want to see that. Okay. We're working on it now. Great. Now i got five things to do for you. Oh, my God. We can't interview you anymore. You're giving me more work. No, I don't have time. I give you, I give you way too much work. I'm sorry. Yeah, right, exactly. You give me a lot of crap is what you give me. Sorry. <laughs> Back to film. Let's go to film now. Now that we've talked about right. the, the TV thing, the, the one other thing, though, I did want to do before we move off the TV uh, segment part here is to kind of talk to you in terms of, obviously, some of these people are iconic in terms of Bernie Mac and the whole Sons of Anarchy thing and Chelsea Lately. You know, you've got some people that are well-established and out there. Tell me how being on a television set varies from flipping it to film per se because that's a whole different you know, the Hollywood A-listers, things like that. How does that vary for you? Um, Time-wise, it's, it's, it's pretty much a time thing. So, like, if you're doing a TV show, it has to fall within 22 minutes. So, like, you can't draw out a speech or you can't – everything has to be quick. <clears throat> and it, have, it seem like it's natural. So they'll tell you, like, you have to say something. Like, you got to sit um, across the street. That you got to say it fast. You got to say it faster. And you're like, well, I'm going to – and they're like, but it has to be natural. So you have to say these things. You have to be um, aware of the time in TV, whereas movies, you can take your time and you can just stretch things out and you make it more dramatic or more funny or you can give a look or whatever you want to do. You have the freedom of not being in the time press. Okay, and then did you find on um, any of these sets, per se, TV-wise, is there an extensive lead time, meaning that, you know, you come on set on this particular time and then it's 10 hours later before you're shooting? I mean, did you experience that, like on Sons, for instance, because I've heard that? Um, it happens, but um, when I was on Sons, I shot the whole day, so I was just on set the whole day. Um, but it's been some times where I'd be in my trailer more than I would shoot, so it happens. Yeah. Got it. Did that ever Did that ever turn you off, do you think? But you're kind of like, man, this is a drag. I'm sitting here for like 15 <laughs> hours twiddling my thumb. No, it's not. No, it's not at all a drag. I mean, whenever I get to go on sets and stuff like that, I'm just so happy, and um, that I'm that I'm getting to be creative. That I don't think about anything but studying those lines and hanging out and talking to people and then uh, going and filming. So I don't get discouraged about anything on set. Gotcha. 
And, of course, obviously, you know, you're used to the drill, of course, so, you know, you're becoming more and more and more accustomed to it, so I suppose it gets easier for you. Um, I want to talk about film for a little bit here. I know that some of my personal choices as it relates to your embossment of work are um, three little words, broken glass, and the longest yard. Now, I know it must have served to be memorable to work with the legendary Burt Reynolds, which is a face of many years in the acting yeah. industry. Um, did you find yourself starstruck being around him as well? <laughs> I wasn't star. I wasn't starstruck being around Burt Reynolds. I saw uh, um, he was so cool. I mean, because you know, you obviously know Burt Reynolds from back in the day. So I'm like, uh, wow, it's Burt Reynolds. Um, I was more starstruck by Adam Sandler than Burt Reynolds. But Burt Reynolds came over and just hung out and talked. And he was like, hey man, let's get a picture. And all like it was him saying these things, not me. And it was so cool that afterwards I was more starstruck by him. And I was like, oh, that's Burt Reynolds over there. Like, <laughs> It was so cool. He was like the coolest dude ever. Okay. And then did you find yourself, um, pertaining to the longest yard, let's say, we'll start with that, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. Where did that come from? Did somebody offer you that opportunity on the basis of doing the other television programs? Or is this a process where you just find out about an opportunity and read for it? No. In fact, uh, that was another background thing that just turned great. So I went there just to do background. And I wanted to be a background football player, <clears throat> but they told me that I didn't look like a football player, so I'd have to be a cameraman. And I was like, well, whatever, man. I've played football my whole life, but if you gave me a cameraman, I'll do it. So I got to sit down on the sidelines with everybody else, with all the um, stars. And um, so I'm down there with Adam Sandler, Stone Cold, just all these dudes. And it was it was so cool that we used to talk. We get to talk to all these people. Nelly was there. Chris Rock was there. And we just hang out and talk for, I would say, eight out of the 12 hours we would be there because filming was, like, few and far between. So we would just sit around and talk and hang out, and um, it was really cool. And then one day they offered me a role to um, shoot this James Cromwell. And um, it didn't make the movie, but that was, like, kind of an, an end to acting was that movie. And, and now that you're throwing out some of those names, I had forgotten about that because, you know, I don't know if anyone knows this, and I don't know if you're a big fan, but we are major WWE fans in here. So when you say Stone Cold Steve Austin, I'm like, oh, my God, I would have just fell over yeah. the on the ground. Like, oh, my God, it's Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's yeah. funny how you can have that, all those, you know, stage presences all in one place and be like, oh, my God, don't you think you've got, like, the coolest job in the whole wide world? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking the whole time. Goldberg okay. was there. It was it was like it was it was a kid's dream to see all of these people there at once. Oh, I imagine so. Now, um obviously we all know that the you know, in terms of your other pieces of film work that you've done, if people want to go back and try to watch these movies, are they accessible to them? I mean, meaning do you, I don't know if we can go to a local video store anymore because people don't. How do they get to watch <laughs> some of this stuff? Well, you know what I'm saying. You know, it's all about Yeah, no. Uh, I would think like Netflix or um I would think Netflix, you can probably find it online somewhere, I would think. If, and if it's something you can't find, Facebook me and I'll send it to you. How funny is Carl? I'm sitting here asking him to pimp his own work. Um, I'm not really sure where you can find that. <laughs> yeah, this is going well, Carl. Great. Just look it up online, people. Apparently, <laughs> Carl can't online. find his own work. <laughs> I, I was in a movie. I don't know where it is. I can't find it. You can't buy it. You can't watch it, apparently, because I don't know where the hell it is. Good. I think pretty much Probably. anything's on Netflix, though, right? Actually, I think it might be, you know, and honestly, depending on the year, because, you know, The Longest Yard wasn't obviously just done, you know, in the last year or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think some of the older things, you may have to, you know, go to the online thing, because even when you go to Blockbuster, I mean, I'm a huge Marilyn Monroe fan. Tell me where I can walk in and buy that movie, any of her movies. You just can't, you know what I'm saying? And that was ages mm-hmm. ago. So my guess is, people, if you're going to look, I would do maybe Amazon. I would do um you know, Blockbuster.com or Netflix or something like that. I'm sure you're probably out there somewhere. Yeah, we might be able to find you somewhere because you're an actor. Remember that. <laughs> um, now, I want to know at this particular point, um, do you feel personally that you have defined your acting choice? What I mean by that is, if I asked you right now, are you definitive TV versus film versus theater? Have you chosen mm-hmm. one and said, okay, you know what, I'm going to be strictly this? Well, uh, theater is out now um, because 
like in theater is is one take. You read a script, you you uh you get it to heart and you go. Now and it's like I've been in TV and movies and you get to uh do it over and over and over and you can say line whenever you feel like it and they'll just read you your line. So I'm like really spoiled by that and I don't think I don't think I have it in me to go back to a theater and um and get a whole theater a play to heart. So I mean I would welcome in the challenge but I would rather T V and movies. Okay. Got it. And I know this is a cliche question. I know a lot of people ask this, but I am truly interested to ask your take on this. You know, if somebody who happens to be listening in right now or somebody who's ever had an aspiration to get into, you know, television and movies, acting, production, or otherwise, do you have any good solid advice for them, you know, just based on your experience in terms of what would you tell them to do? I would tell them to um, come out here <laughs> and, and um, like, pursue it. I think most people think it's unpursuable and they don't do it, so... Come out here and pursue it, and it'll probably happen. Um, John Goodman, I, I watched an interview with him, and he said like he was here for 10 years, 15 years, or something like that, before he got Roseanne. And he was just like, you know what, this is long enough. I'm I'm ready to go home. And he finally got Roseanne, and he was like, this is why you stay. This is why you stay and you do these things. You think maybe it won't happen for you, but then it, it probably will. Wonderful to hear, you know, because I know that I've talked to other individuals that are in the business, per se, and not all of their experiences have been great. They've been, like, competition fierce. You know what I mean? There's so mm-hmm. many faces out here. Some people, you know, the younger crowd, if you will, meaning that if you're a younger actor, you have a far better chance. You know, I mean, you don't have an American idol for acting, you know, so it's kind of like you're all thrown into that pool. I mean, I mean, do you think some of that's true and that it's very competitive and political and um, kind of tough for the newbies? It is, really. Um competitive and very political and it's kind of like a catch-22 because if you try to get an agent they'll they'll say well you don't have any credits so i don't want to rep you and you're like well how am i to get credits if i don't have an agent and they'll be like well get yourself some credits and then we'll we'll talk and this is really weird but if you get out here and i mean you have to invest in yourself you have to know yourself everybody can't be tom cruise some people have to be some people lead in man material some people are you know other material and just know who you are be willing to be other until you can be a leading person um and invest in yourself you have to put money into it you have to take classes you have to take pictures you have to do a lot of stuff uh it's not just come out here and sit at a starbucks and the director say hey you want to be in movies because i think that's what people think it is so um come out here pursue it and invest in yourself and I think you'll be all right. And knock on Carl's door because Carl's going to be president. He's going to be on Sons of Anarchy. He's going to be in drag <laughs> and on my reality show. That's like five things. Okay. <laughs> now, I can tell you that my attention peaked, of course, with the mention of your work encounters because I know you've done work with both Cameron Crowe and Snoop Dogg. Now, how does <laughs> one... Oh, my yeah. God, he's laughing at me. <laughs> no, okay, that, lo- that is... That happened. Okay. Now... How do you find yourself in that unique position? How, how I mean, they just approached you, or you were kind of like knocking on their door. What happened? Uh, the Cameron Crowe thing was an uh, I was an audition. Um, yeah, it was an audition, and um, it was weird that I I didn't get the part in the audition. So um, he invited me on set and told me that he had something else for me, and then um, and it, it didn't happen that day. So I was leaving. I was like, well, you know, it's Hollywood. People say things. And I was leaving. He had a PA chase me down and was like, can you come back tomorrow? I want to I want to do the thing that I promised you tomorrow. Just come back. And I came back, and he shot me the next day. And he was really cool. And, he, like, we talked for a while, and he was pretty cool. And the Snoop Dogg thing, I don't know how that came about. <laughs> I really don't. I don't remember how that came about. But I remember Snoop Dogg being really cool and really cordial and, um, yeah, I wish I knew how it came about. Maybe an audition. I don't know. Yeah, and it's so funny because I was on Facebook actually, and I came across one of those pictures where, of course, Snoop Dogg was with Charlie Hunnam, and I'm just like, oh my God, Snoop Dogg's personality to me would just seem, um, 
there's nothing short of a character. You know what I mean? A Carl McDowell, if you will. You know what I mean? He's just got this vibrance and character, and you can throw him in with, like, suits and tie kind of guys, and he just rolls with mm-hmm. everybody, and he doesn't, you know, it doesn't change who he is. You know what I'm saying? No. Which I think is totally cool. I do. I absolutely. Now, before I go on to the next question, I wanted to throw out to the listening audience, of course, if they want to call in, obviously, now would be the time where they can start calling in to ask you questions. I wanted to tell you that our beloved Sam Crow is actually listening to our show, and he wanted to give you a message, which is, he loves you, and the Crow Eaters love you, and we can't wait to have you back on the show a second time, if you even want to interview with me a second time, <laughs> which you probably won't after today. Oh, my Anytime. God. And I love Sam Crow. That, that's one of the, he's one of the coolest dudes I've ever met. Like, Tell me about like, it. I've never, me? I've never met him personally, but just like phone calls, texts, Facebook chats. I mean, he's just he's really cool. And I, I really try, I try not to like Facebook chat a person a book, but like men as do, we write novels to each other, and it's pretty cool. He's like one of the coolest human beings I've ever, I've ever known. Wow, and I'm jealous. You talk to Sam Crow more than you talk to me. Ouch. <laughs> I'm just loving on total fall. I'm just president of the Carl McDowell fan club, but yeah, what do I get? I get nada. I get zero. I get a lot do of grief. Yeah. <laughs> Carl needs to step it up. I'm just gonna throw I'll step it up. I'll yeah, write you, you novels from now on. Oh, Lord, look at that. No, are you kidding me? I wouldn't want to take anything away from Sam Crow. And I do think that we need to approach Sam Crow at some point in time for you and I and he to get together and kind of hang out and have dinner and listen to you sing and do stand-up comedian stuff because I'm, I am curious. Can you tell the listening audience if they happen to be in the area, do you have a standing stint somewhere or is there a place that they can go and see you in person? Um, You come around my house and we can just hang out and play video games. <laughs> wow. Be, Don't come watch we my go comedy. We karaoke in. We, we carry. I haven't done comedy in a while. Like I haven't done comedy in years, actually. I, I'm getting a lot of people telling me to start doing it again, but I just want to focus on acting and focus. Like the, the comedy game is more political than the acting game, and if um, it will really wear you thin. So I just want to focus on acting, and um, maybe one day I'll, I'll feel like doing comedy again. I still write stuff down, and I write, like, jokes and all that kind of stuff, but I just haven't performed in a long time. I gotcha. And is there a particular reason for that? I mean, did it, is it just that the acting has taken you away from it, or, I mean, do you have a desire to pursue this? I have a desire. It's just not as big as my desire to act. So um, that's I want to act more than I want to do comedy. Comedy is like a hobby. It's not – it was fun while I was doing it, and uh, but it just got way too political. Like, you would show up at a comedy club – at 9 p.m. and not get on until 2, and it would be like three people in the audience, and and then you have to know people in order to get on shows. And I mean, I got, I started getting good shows and stuff like that, but I mean, it just it drew me too thin, and it was like, well, I just want to focus on acting. I gotcha. And if there's one thing that I could ask you in terms of where you'd want to embark career-wise, if it wasn't the acting or music or this or that. Would you dabble in something? I mean, is there something out there that you want to try that you haven't done yet? Hmm. No. <laughs> no. No, it's nothing. This well, no, it's nothing that I haven't done that I would want to do. Career-wise, I just want to act and then um, retire and move to Seattle and get old. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Got it. And come back to Chicago so you can visit me, of course, because you are my kissing. Of husband. course. Yeah. Of absolutely. Course. So did you get that? He doesn't want to do anything else in his life, and he doesn't know where his work is on the Internet. Okay. <laughs> Just so you all know that are listening in, I'm giving Carl a lot of crap because we are friends and I can do that. And so I think I think yeah. it's really cool that you can roll with that. Um, the next question I have for you, without maybe spilling the entire project, what might you provide to the listeners regarding um, the film A Many Splintered Thing, which I know stars Giovanni Ribisi and Michelle Monaghan? Yes. What made me do it? Uh, uh, well, first of all, can you tell us anything about it? Can you tell us when we can find it? And, of course, obviously the decision to do it. Where, where did that come from? Um, well, it's being it's in post-production now, so it's being edited, and it should probably be out, uh, I would say, well, summer, winter, fall, something like that. I don't know yet. They haven't given us any dates. We just had the wrap party like a month ago, so... Um, yeah, I don't know when it's going to come out, but I will. you guys will be the first to know whenever I find out. 
And what made me do it was uh, one of my friends produced it. And um, she had me come in and read for her, and I read and um, got the part. And uh, it was huge that um, Giovanni Ribisi is, like, one of my favorite actors. And I saw him, and I was like, wait, Giovanni Ribisi's on this thing? And it was like, it was like the, the I don't know, it was like hearing that it was the Santa Claus again. It was pretty cool. And Michelle Monaghan, I know, has done work before, um, I want to say Tom Cruise, but I might be wrong here. I know I've done some kind of a film, actually, and I, I was curious on your take on her, obviously, because she she looks very stellar, if you will. You know, just kind of that stone coldish kind of get into character, get out of character. Did you have any experience working with her directly? I did. Um, the scene that I did was uh, me, Michelle, Chris Evans, and um, a, another friend of mine. And it was it was like an ensemble scene. So, like, you know, we had to have the timing down correct and everything. Everybody had to be on their marks at a certain time. And it, it was pretty professional. And everybody, um, everybody did it. And, and it was all smiles. It was no... Divas, there was no, you know, nobody messing up. It was everybody was really professional, and it was it was fun to be around. It was it was fun to do. Awesome. Now I have two more questions for you. Oh my God, you finally made it through almost this entire interview. Holy mackerel! I know I've been riding your tail a little bit, but that's okay. You're not stuck with me that much longer. Um, two <laughs> questions for you, in terms of um, the future. Wh- where do you see yourself, or what direction? I mean, what do we have coming up? Um, do you have roles that you're reading for? What can we expect out of you in the next year, let's say? In the next year? Um, hey, your guess is as good as mine, really. I'm just waiting for work. I'm I'm thinking now of um, going to Chicago and doing, like, assemblies for schools and, and talking to inner-city kids and telling them, like, you know, there's things that they can do um, instead of gangbanging and stuff like that. But um, work-wise... Um, just waiting for some work to come my way. And, um, yeah, that's about it. I gotcha. And now as individuals, I mean, and outside of Average Hughes, you were saying you can come and hang with you and blah, blah, blah. If, from a professional standpoint, meaning do you do appearances? Are you out and about, whether it be with the Sons of Anarchy cast or otherwise, where you're accessible to your fans or where individuals can come and see you on a professional level? Oh, no, not really. Um, I... <sighs> Trying to no. help you, Carl. <laughs> you are trying to help me. Um, no, I guess like socially, um, social media is where I'm at mostly. Um, but I'm rarely out. Like I, I, I'm a homebody. I stay in the house mostly, unless I go karaoke in or go hang out with my friends or something like that. But um, I don't make appearances. Um, oh, I haven't made appearances. Uh, I'm welcome to it. I'm open to it. Okay, I got it. Okay, I got it. Now, um, I guess the very last question that I have for you is, um, if individuals want to get in contact with the charity that you worked with, tell us how we're able to do that, and additionally, tell us how we were able to find you social media as their life. Um, well, the charity that I worked with was People of the World and Racism. I don't know if um, they're still up and going. Um, I will find out, and I will put it up on Facebook. Um, I was doing this other Samuel Shell thing. It's a homeless shelter in Santa Monica that me and my friends would go down and cook for. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, again, I don't know all the info on that but either. I'll post that up on Facebook as well or on Twitter. And on social media, you can find me on Twitter, um, Carl, at Carl McDowell, and at Facebook, it's Carl McDowell, my name. Okay, I got it. Um, obviously, I should probably be your PR person too, because the next time you, you do it, you don't ever, ever say I don't you know. Should. You're supposed to be I on have my no radio idea. And I am with this. Here's where I'm at. This is how you find me. I'm for hire. Here's who I'm working with in the future. Got it? <laughs> you should totally be my PR person. Oh please, are you serious? I can't even PR me half the time. So give me a break. No. <laughs> All right, I got one more question because this one I know I can get away with with you because there's no way this is going to happen with Dayton Kelly next week. I'm 100% right. positive that I will, ask, will not ask this question, but you know I'm going to ask this question. Uh-oh. Here's the question. Are you ready? 
I'm ready. For the, for the listening audience who doesn't know this, I have to ask if Carl McDowell is single or if he has a girl and what's going to happen with his love life. Because you know all the honeys out there are like, oh, my God, he's so fine. So i got to ask. Oh, Jesus. Uh, well, do I do have a girlfriend. Um, wow. I've been with her for like 10 or 11 years. I don't know how many years exactly, so that's probably going to get me in a little trouble. But, um, yeah, I have a girl. And we've been together for a long time, so it's a cool thing. I got you. And are you a dad as well? I am a dad. I have three boys. And they're grown? They are pretty grown. They're like uh, 13, 14, and 14. One is Carl Jr., one is Deontay, one is Dion. Oh, absolutely. Very cool. And you know what was really cool about that? You didn't say, I don't know. You actually well, did it <laughs> the rich children. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna still kill me when I get off the air. I can see it already. I'm sorry, folks, for having a lot of fun, and this is just coffee, mind you. Now we have a caller, so I'm gonna shut up so you can actually listen oh. to them, and then we'll get them on the line. Okay. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Who's talking at me? Michelle, Cindy. <gasps> Michelle Williamson. Holy mackerel, Michelle's in the house. I am honored. I can't believe it. Carl and Michelle at the same time. I, I can't. I can't <laughs> Hi, Carl. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I just want to take the time out to, you know, just let Sydney know and you know that, you know, it's been great and such a pleasant experience hearing, you know, the few few members we had on the show to, you know, the pleasant voice to go with the face. It's very enlightening. Aww. That's, so well, that's how I feel as well. Like, I see a bunch of you guys on Facebook, but I never hear you voices. So it's cool to put the voice with the person. And Michelle, he'll continue to talk to me, or he'll continue to talk to you, and he will not be talking to me anymore, I'm sure of that. Since this interview, I gave him so much flack. <laughs> You'll become his new best friend now, because he'll be like, yeah, Cindy, who's that Cindy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have an Nobody interesting question? Oh, cut it out. Do you have a good question for him, Michelle? I'm sure you do. Unfortunately, I asked most of them in the group. Uh, I think it was what, last week when uh, we were having on-air trouble before. But yeah. I just wanted to wish him much success in everything that he does. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing him again on, on the show. We hope. Well, thank you. We're hoping. We are we're hoping. hoping. And, Michelle, I hope that uh, you heard me when I said that I think we should all rally together and do the fan club thing for him, and I think we should get him nice and tight with his PR, and I think we need to take care of all this stuff for him. <laughs> so we'll get on that off air. Absolutely. We'll do that. Yeah, we will do that. All right, honey, I'm going to let you go. we got another call okay. here, but thanks, sweetheart. I appreciate it. Okay, love you guys. Take care. I love you, too. All right. Bye-bye. All right, Carol, batter up. we got another one for you. All right. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello? Hi, who am I speaking to? Hi, it's Ann Jenny. <gasps> Ann Jenny. Oh, my yeah. God. I got a two in a row here. I'm getting excited, people. Cut it out. Make it my Friday. Hi, Carl. How are you? Hello. Good. Ann. Yes, I'm a big fan of yours. Oh, wow. Thank you. And I just wanted to just say hi and pop in. I know you probably have a lot of callers. And I just talked to my brother, Sam Crow, and um, I was like, oh, I want to get on. <laughs> and I got in. <laughs> yeah, we try to accommodate so, absolutely everyone. Yeah, so it's a pleasure. And, Cindy, you're doing such a great job. Oh, honey, thank you. Yes, so she is. So sweet. Oh, my yeah. God, even Carl said that. See, that he knew. He knew I was doing a good job. It's good Carl knows that. Thank you. Thank but, you, Carl, thank you. I'm really honored to talk to you. And, um... Good luck with everything you're doing, and much love and respect to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Thank honored you. to talk to you as well. You're welcome. And I'll let you get so you can get another caller. All right. That sounds wonderful, yeah. Michelle. You have a great weekend, honey. Okay, bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Now, we don't have another caller on the line, so, of course, I'll ask you another question until we do, actually, because we have about 15 minutes left or maybe a little bit less than that, of course, and unfortunately, that's all the time I have for Carl today because I have to go on film myself today. So, 
I can't spend all day oh, talking yeah. to you, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, I do have another question for you. I guess what I'm trying to ascertain for you, in case individuals don't know, is that Carl, of course, lives in Los Angeles, California. And for most of us, we already know that the bulk of the entertainment industry basically, you know, resides at kind of the heart and soul of everything. My question to you is this. Do you feel as though, because of the locale, meaning being in California, has that uh, 100% facilitated your ability to be able to further your career as an actor, meaning let's say you go back to Chicago or otherwise, I mean, do you think that you're going to have limited abilities, per se? I think, yeah, I think you would have limited abilities. I mean, there's an industry in Chicago and there's an industry in New York. Um, The one in New York is obviously bigger than the one in Chicago, and the one in New York is mostly plays and Broadway and that sort of thing, theater. Um, Chicago is theater, but it's it's a small scale. Um, I think if you want to be in the industry, you want to come to Los Angeles. This is the place to be. This, I mean, it helps out a lot. Oh, I imagine so. And um, of course, like we had talked about earlier, one of the things that was kind of going through my head here is is I guess I just got to I got to go back to the same thing. I mean, do you ever really fear that you're going to end up becoming, like I said, that typecast? where it's going to be, okay, I'm a bigger guy, I fit the profile of this, blah, 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 that it's unfortunately going to continue to be like that? Um, Maybe. Um, I'm hoping not, but I'll tell you, if you're being typecast, you're working. So <laughs> I would like to work. I like to work. So uh, if I'm being typecast, I'll be typecast until um, they figure out that I can do bigger and better things. Okay, I got it. And um, I wanted to also ask, because I don't think that we touched on this at all, because I couldn't remember if you came from a family background, meaning if individuals in your family have been in the business or in entertainment or any genre like that, and were they supportive of your endeavor? Um, no, none of my family member family members were in entertainment. Um, they all live in Chicago, and they do nothing in the entertainment business. They are supportive, though. Like, my mother is the the biggest fan you could ever have. Like, she sits my family down. If they come around her house, she sits them down and, like, shows them everything I've ever done. And I get calls from family members like, yeah, I went by your mom's house, and she showed me everything. I was there for, like, eight hours, and I was like, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry you had to watch that. But that's how she is. She's, she's, she's high strung, and she's really proud. And um, so that's a cool thing. My sister's the same way. Like, they fight over... Uh, they'll call me up and be like, Mama took my movie. Can you send me another one? And stuff like that. So <laughs> I find that that's really cool, and I like that, that they support us. I gotcha. And so this way all i got to do is look up Mama McDowell and be like, hey, I interviewed your son. Let's go hang. We'll watch, like, four movies. <laughs> I bet she knows how to find your work. Let's call Mama McDowell up right now. Where's your son's movie? He doesn't know, so let's ask her. <laughs> she just called me up and be like, send me this movie. I, I broke the other one, and I'll send it. I'll send her another copy. Oh, that's absolutely amazing. And what's your um, what's your uh, children's take on this? I mean, do they? I mean, I'm assuming that they have not only great pride for you, but has it maybe encouraged them to possibly look at, you know, either the musical side of things or the acting side of things, or maybe kind of walk in your footsteps? And if so, would you want them to? Um, I don't think I don't think they really care. <laughs> I think uh, one, Ouch. I was on Tosh Point O once, and uh. I had to do, like, this new thing on Tosh.0, and my kid saw it, and he was like, what the hell was that, Dad? And I, so, I mean, like, I think it embarrasses him more than anything else, um, especially if I do something stupid like Tosh.0, like something funny. Um, uh, but they're, they're, like, they're in high school, so it's it's nothing as cool that your parents are doing. And uh, I don't think they really find it great, but... Um, one of my kids came down and he was uh, on set with me and he loved it. He loved every minute of it. And um, but I really would not want them to pursue this path. Like it's it's really hard and it takes a lot out of you and, and you being judged constantly, like on a daily basis. People telling you no, you shouldn't be acting. No, you're not good for my movie. No, you're not good for my show. And it could it could take a toll on you. And I wouldn't want my kids going through that. So, I mean, have you have you found yourself in a, in a capacity to where you can maybe not desensitize your, desensitize yourself, but just be like, you know what? How how do you handle that when somebody comes to you and says, you know what, you're just not right, or they're continuously turning you down for roles? 
You become desensitized? I, I guess that is the right word. Um, yeah, I'm desensitized to it. I just think uh, if you don't think I'm right for your role, you're crazy. So, so I don't think it's me. I think it's them. And I don't know. Maybe one day they'll be like, I should have got him for that role. So, I don't. But I never, I never get down about it. If if I don't get the part, I don't get the part. It was. It could have been a million reasons why I didn't. Um. So I don't. I don't think about it at all. Okay, I got gotcha. you. And I guess that makes sense to me. Obviously, parent to parent here. I mean, certainly you don't want to have your children kind of go through that experience. Um, do you ever find that your kids have ever come to you and been like, has your career made you as dad? Has that made it? You know how you see some people out in the paparazzi and this and that and stuff like that. Are you know are they recognizable as Carl's kids and that has an impact on how people treat them or even for you for that matter? Has has your relationship? Then altered or changed because of you finding success as an actor? Um, I don't know. Like, um, my kids are, one One is in Vegas and the other two are in Illinois. So um, I don't know that, I, I know that they talk about it because one told me, like, his teacher saw me on something. So I know they do talk about it. I don't know of the treatment that they're getting or if they're getting uh, treated different because of me or anything like that. I would hope not. I would hope they were getting treated the same as everybody else. Um oh, I but know. I yeah, and I I I guess I get good treatment. I don't know. I don't know if I do if I don't. I've always I don't know. That's a that's a good well, question. I think it is. Well, I think it speaks to something because, you know, I've had an interview before on my other show where I've talked to an individual and the one thing that they came back to me was is you notice how you know, you start with your core friends. Before there was even a Carl McDowell Sons of Anarchy, you were just a regular dude. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. you start to get some popularity, and then you'll notice that, or at least some have told me that they've noticed, oh, look, all of a sudden people come out of the woodwork, and then they're standing there and they're supporting you and they're your number one fan. You know what I'm saying? That sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that that does happen. happen, but, I mean, you got to keep those – you got to keep that – you got to keep yourself grounded, I think, and, uh, you know um, – I guess I just watch who comes around me, and I won't allow somebody to come around just to be a yes man or just to be that sort of person. I'll just stick to my core people. That's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Well, I'll tell you, my friend, it's gotten very quiet here on the phone lines. Apparently, everybody wants Cindy to talk to Carl McDowell. <laughs> yeah. Instead of them talking to you, which I can't believe because you know what? You're such an easy person to talk to. And I have to tell you, i got to throw this out at you because I know that, again, Sam is listening, and he just, he made this very, very sweet statement. He was mentioning, you know, hands down, he's like, Carl's an awesome guy. He's like, the brother I've never had deserves all the success he gets, and he's got your back 24-7. I think that is just awesome. That's the epitome of just brotherhood. You know, you get that brotherhood, sisterhood thing going on. That's amazing. I think that's awesome. That uh, I love know, it. He speaks volumes. This is what I will tell you in closing as it relates to Paul McDowell. The fact that I gave you a lot of crap here through this entire interview. There's three things I've taken from you, and I hope that the listening audience will understand this as well. You're very multifaceted. What's what's really cool about you is stardom has not struck you and been like, I'm the shit. You're very grounded. You are very open to the idea of being across the board in any field. Um, I think that everything that you take on, you take on 100% and with heart, and you do it very, very well. You're very polished at what you do. You're impressive as a man. You're impressive as an actor. I'm very proud to call you my friend, Um, and I appreciate the support you've given me, the support you give to our sisters, to everybody out there. You're very inspiring, I think, and I I would be completely disappointed if I don't find you in a Chicago school or otherwise, because to me, you exemplify the modicum of a success story. How's that? Wow. That's, that's a little better than <laughs> Carl doesn't know what he's doing, huh? <laughs> that's, that's much better than Carl. That almost brought me to tears. You know what it's true. And, and, you know, I'm honored. I actually have to tell you that I am the one who feels honored to talk to you. And I will be crushed if you won't come back and give me a lot of crap for another hour sometime. I will totally come back and give you crap for an hour. <laughs> and don't forget Never about you. because now you're going to get all big now that I've said to you and giving you this crap and then like <laughs> let's let's embark on this project this project you're going to get all big and you're going to be like Sam Crow Radio Cindy <laughs> who are these people I hope not that would never happen oh gosh I certainly hope not alright now in closing before I let you go I want you to do one more thing please 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 
tell everybody who's listening either now or who will listen to the interview. They want to get a hold of Carl McDowell. How do they do so again? You go on Facebook and you type in Carl McDowell or Twitter at Carl McDowell. That's C A R L M C D O W E L L. Okay. That's it, huh? That is it. But then he's going to build a website, Pete. So what happens is when he gets his next major role, it's going to be a whole website about his experience on Sons of Energy, the longest yard. He's going to have a bunch of links, and he's going to become very popular. Trust as soon me, as friend. Cindy gets on that. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> Time for you to go to karaoke, my friend. All right. And then you can text me from the bar or something like that. And I text all of okay. us to tell us what the hell are you doing. Honey, I meant what I said. I've had an immensely wonderful time with you. Please, please, please stay in touch. I will. And thank you. And thanks, Sam. Thank you. Not a problem at all. all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we'll talk to you soon, my dear. Cool. Bye. All right, honey. Okay, folks. Woo! I am so glad and happy to report that we got that under our belt. Thank you so very, very much to my dear friend, Carl McDowell. Again, I always have to say uh, my heart and my allegiance and and much appreciation goes to uh, Sam Crow. That kind of goes without saying. I'm sure all of you ladies and everyone knows that. I I have an allegiance to him that's undying. I think he's doing fabulous things with his shows. I appreciate the fact that he takes the time and the trouble and the research to reach out to individuals so that we can make this a quality production. I want to say thank you to the Corridius Club, of course, the administrators, all the participants, all everybody. I'm immensely grateful to have established relationships with you and will hopefully continue to do so. And I appreciate the love and the support that you've been giving to me. And again, I always want to say that I want to continue to provide the absolute best product that I can for you all. I I want this to be a success. I want us to be bigger. I want us to be better. Uh, I want to remind everybody, of course, that our next interview is going to be on February 5th. And of course, that's going to be none other than Mr. Unser himself, Dayton Kelly. I cannot tell you how tickled pink I am to be able to say that I'm going to be hosting this show. Um, we're going to get a great opportunity to talk to him about things, you know, and, and again, I want to make this adamantly clear that in the future, I realize that we are Sam Crow Radio, which means we're linked up as it relates to Sons of Anarchy, but I want to try to also delve into, as you can see by my interviews, their lives, their theater productions, their film productions, their awards, their accolades. I, I want to go well beyond the Sam Crow thing, just to let you all know that. Um, so definitely tune in February 5th. We have the uh, Sam Crow radio page, and we have the event that's set up already, so go ahead and sign up. Please feel free to listen in. The one thing I do want to let you ladies know, unfortunately, is it's going to be a straight one-hour interview. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be having a call-in session for that. This is just a listen-in thing. So I would appreciate if you keep that in mind and pass the word along on that. Um, on Dayton Kelly's show, at the end of that, I'm going to be giving you a heads-up in reference to a contest we're having because we're going to start having giveaways and giving out things. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to participate in that. Last thing I want to talk about real quickly before I let you off the air is I do have to toot the horn of our wonderful sponsor of the show, our very first one. And again, peeps, I'm open to suggestions. Anybody you know, anybody you might be interested in sponsoring our show, please send them my way. Nicole of Liberty Pure Natural. First off, I'll give you a website, www.nicoleann.labrie.com. And for all of you that don't know, Labrie Pure and Natural is basically natural skincare products that are offered excuse me, at a very affordable price. Six ninety five, you get the small shipping fee, you get a first free seven day starter kit. Perfect for you ladies out there. It helps in terms of chemical and skincare products. You get to find out how skincare products enter into your bloodstream. And what's really cool about Labrie is that they use only natural ingredients. I myself have tried the product, so I can tell you hands-on, it's an excellent product. www.nicoleann.labrie.com. Go ahead and check it out. All right, my friends, I'm going to let you go for the weekend. You have yourself a wonderful afternoon. Much love and respect to all of you, and please make sure you tune in on the fifth. Take care. Target's got everything you need to ready, set, go back to school. Ready? Okay. We got paper, yes we do. Michael notebooks, pencils, glue. We got crayons, every hue. School supplies for your whole crew. Target's got everything you need to ready, set, go back to school.